We've spent the last several lessons taking a look at the idea of intersections. We started with the intersection of lines in R2, and that's something that's familiar from a number of previous courses. And then we moved on to R3. So we looked at the intersection of two lines in R3. We looked at the intersection of a line and a plane in R3. And we're going to conclude this discussion with a look at the intersection of two planes in R3. Now one of the things that you'll notice is missing from this treatment or this discussion is that there is no one solution for these. Uh, and the reason for that is when two planes intersect, those two planes, as you can see in this illustration I have to the right, the smallest intersection that you can have for two planes is along a line. And a line comprises an infinite number of points. So that's our first option. And so when we do this, in all likelihood, the solution that we're going to get to describe the situation will be the parametric equations of this straight line of intersection. We also have the option of the planes being coincident. And I haven't drawn that because it's very difficult to show things being coincident. It means they're the same plane. Under those circumstances, we have an infinite number of solutions. That's the same as we had in, in part one. It's just, it's a different infinity, as strange as it is to hear it said that way. In this case, our infinite number of solutions describes all of the points on the plane, on the shared plane, whereas here we have an infinite number of points on the shared line. And then finally, we have the situation where there is no solution, and that would be two planes that are parallel to each other, and when we talk about planes being parallel, we're talking about their normal vectors will also work out to be parallel or collinear. But in this case, the two planes are distinct from each other, and so as a result, there's no solution. This is also known as an inconsistent system, because there is no solution. Something I'd also like to, to point out, just for, for you to give some thought to, is we can actually take three planes and come up with a, with a single point of intersection. And the reason for that is that if two planes intersect along a line, then two other planes also intersect along a line, and you can take those two lines of intersection, and you can intersect them to form a single point of intersection. So we can also combine some of the things we've been looking at with this idea of planes and also going back to what we looked at with the intersection of lines. So we're going to work through some examples now. And I've got each of the three different options, a line intersection, coincident planes, and parallel but distinct for no solution. I have each of those to be illustrated in these exercises. Before you even start doing, you could go ahead and you could dive straight into the algebra. So I could just right away, I'm going to label those equation one and equation two. And I could start solving this system of equations. And to be honest with you, it would work out just fine. But if you want a little bit more insight and understanding about why things are going to work out the way they are, I would suggest you actually, in this case, because I'm given my plane in Cartesian format, in this case, I would take a look at the normal vectors. And I might just do that in my head. But that first plane has a normal vector of 1, 4, negative 3. And that second plane has a normal vector of 2, 8, negative 6. And if you want to know whether or not they're collinear, there's a couple of things you can do. You can assign a constant, not sorry, not a constant, but a parameter, and see whether or not that parameter value is consistent. We've looked at that before. A quicker way of doing this, particularly if you're just doing this as rough work, if you're just trying to get an idea, is I normally start with, and this is just a matter of preference, I start with the larger of the values and divide it by the smaller, because that's the scale factor involved. So in this case, the larger of the x's is 2. So I end up with 2 over 1 is equal to 2. And 8 over 4 is equal to 2. And negative 6 over negative 3 is equal to 2. And so I can see that I have a scale factor there. And in fact, the second normal is equal to 2 times the first normal. 
and that means that these planes are parallel so it's going to be it's not going to be a line intersection it has to be one of these two they're either coincident planes or they are parallel and distinct now we're going to do deal with this more formally so I'm going to take equation 1 and 2 now that I know what to expect I'm going to take equation number 1 and I'm going to multiply it by 2 and that's going to create a 2x because I'm going to eliminate those x's but it also creates an 8y it also creates a negative 6z and then this positive 6 turns into positive 12 then I'm going to subtract but I end up with 0 plus 0 minus 0 I was about to say um, plus 1 but that actually works out to be if I'm doing a subtraction minus 1 is equal to 0 so I end up with negative 1 equals 0 and we know that that is not possible or not true that's a false a mathematically false statement and so as a result we know that therefore we have no solution so another way of saying this is to say that this is an inconsistent system and therefore we have no solution and the other thing we can say is that we have planes that are parallel but distinct sorry the systems responding a little slow there as far as the handwriting goes for the next exercise once again I'll just label these as equation 1 and equation 2 and over here in my rough let's take a look at what the normals are for these two 5 negative 1 2 and the second one is negative 25 5 negative 10 and I've chosen numbers they're integers they're pretty easy to work with you can probably see that the scale factor is there uh, but I'm going to show you the other way that you could look for the scale factor is I'm going to say okay I want to write n1 as some factor times n2 so that would only be true and really I'm asking that as a question I'm asking are these collinear so that would be true if the x value for n1 was equal to some factor k times negative 25 which gives me in this case k equals negative one-fifth then I can check the y values so negative one is equal to k times five and that gives me negative one-fifth and finally for the last one we end up with 2 equals k times negative 10 and of course we actually do end up with k equals negative one-fifth in this case so all of those k values are the same which means that they are consistent with each other so that tells us that these two planes are parallel in this case I'm going to take equation 1 and I'm going to multiply it by 5 and that gives me 25x minus 5y plus 10z minus 45 and that's equal to 0 and then I'm going to add those together and I end up with in this case 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0 is equal to 0 which of course simplifies to 0 equals 0 and that is a result that is always true therefore that means we have infinite solutions but as I discussed on the first slide this actually could mean two different things but the fact that we've got these having um, the same normal vectors or at least collinear normal vectors that also tells us that they are the same plane because if we had gotten infinite solutions and it was a line 
this solution itself would actually look quite different and I'm going to show you that in the next slide. So here we have our final pair of planes and in this case again let's take a look at the normal vectors. I would expect you might do this work in your head. I'm just doing it off to the side so you can see it. 4, 7, negative 33 and the second normal is 8, 5, negative 3 and it's quite apparent from this one as soon as you start comparing the x and the y and the z well this x is twice as big as the previous one but that's definitely not the case for the y and these z components are a factor of 10 off of each other so there's no single scaling factor that can make these ones the same so therefore we we know just by virtue of the fact that the planes are not parallel and so that means there must be the solution as a line and that means we're going to get an infinite number of solutions there are infinite points of intersection but we still have to do the algebra because now especially because it's a line we need to come up with an equation for that line so what I'm going to do in this case my x's line up pretty nicely so I again I'm going to take equation 1 and I'm going to multiply it by 2 and I'm going to eliminate my x's so that equation 1 multiplied by 2 becomes 8x plus 14y minus 66z plus 34 and that's equal to 0. In order to eliminate my x's I'm going to do a subtraction so I might as well do equation 2 minus this new equation so I end up with 5 minus 4 that gives me negative 9y negative 3 minus negative 66 which is the same as negative 3 plus 66 so that's plus 63z and then 7 minus 34 that's equal to negative 27 and all of that together is equal to 0 you might notice that we have factors of 9 here so I'm just going to divide everything by 9 and depending on how you want to write this you might also notice oh it might actually be more convenient if I divided everything by negative 9 so I end up with a leading coefficient that's positive that's up to you and so negative 9y divided by negative 9 is simply equal to y positive 63z divided by 9 is minus 7z and negative 27 divided by negative 9 is equal to positive 3 and that's all equal to 0 0 divided by negative 9 is just 0 now at this point we're down to a single equation with two unknowns but we don't have any other equations to draw from so what we're going to do and this is a bit of an unusual step so hopefully it'll make sense to you first I'm going to isolate one of my variables and I'm just going to choose y because it's quite convenient to isolate the y and then I'm going to make the unusual step of saying I'm going to let z take on a parameter so z is going to be the value t and I'm just using t because we've often used t in our parametric equations so that means that y is equal to 7 I was about to write z again 7 t minus 3 and I have z is equal to t so now I'm going to now sub my y and z parametric forms in terms of t back into one of my original equations and I'm just going to go ahead and use uh, equation 1 again so I'm going to sub my z and my y into equation number 1 and so that gives me 4x plus 7 but instead of y I'm going to replace that with the parameterized form which is 7t minus 3 and then it's supposed to be minus 33z but instead of the z 
I'm going to replace that with the parameterized version, which is just simply t in this case, plus 17 is equal to 0. And now I just expand that a bit and do some cleanup on the algebra. So that's going to be 49t minus 21 minus 33t plus 17 and that's equal to 0. So I get 4x, I'll just leave that alone for now. 49t minus 33t is going to give me plus 16t. Negative 21 plus 17 is going to give me minus 4 and that's all equal to 0. Whether you notice this before or after, there's actually a common factor of 4 here, but let's go ahead and let's isolate our 4x first. So we end up with 4x is equal to negative 16t plus 4. And we divide everything through by 4, so we end up with x is equal to negative 4t minus 1. Sorry, uh, plus 1. We divide it through by 4. So now that I have those values, and just to remind you, we also had our y value, which was 7t minus 3. And this all started when we made the parametric substitution that z is equal to t. And these three together, those are the parametric equations of the line that is the solution between these planes. And so I could write this also as a vector equation. I could write this as the vector r is equal to r naught. And r naught is going to come from this positive 1, this negative 3. And there's no initial position vector or, or component here. So we know that means 0. So that would be 1, negative 3, 0, plus the parameter t multiplied by the direction vector, negative 4, 7, and 1. And that is the vector equation of a line. There's our parametric equation of a line. And that came from the intersection of two planes. Now I don't mention it before I just go on. We're done with the lesson now. I don't mention it, but I've given all the times I've given you your equations of planes, I've given you the equations of the planes in Cartesian form. What if you get the equations of the planes in vector form? Well, it still works. I would recommend then you switch over to parametric equations, set all the x's, set all the y's, set all the z's to each other, and solve from there. Your other option would be to convert everything to Cartesian form. And there we have some assigned work. You don't have to start with 1, 2, and 3, but if you run into any trouble with 6, 8, and 10, I recommend you go back and try 1, 2, and 3. They have some matching examples from the textbook that you can go back and look at as well.